Okay, wounds and horses and proud flesh. Um, I've organized into three basic topics tonight. Uh, the first is just the basics of skin. Second is wound basics. And the third is gonna be granulation tissue or what horsemen call proud flesh. There are a couple of pictures in here and it literally there's like two, maybe three that if you have a weak stomach, uh, you might not want to look, and I promise you that I will tell you that when they're coming up, I don't think they're very disgusting. I think they're very light, um, but there is a little one with some blood in it. So if you've got a queasy stomach, I'll try and let you know. This is my friend George. Uh, I love him. He's a mammoth um, uh, donkey that I work on. But um, I just want to start by saying wounds heal easily, but humans tend to complicate it and mess things up. There's nothing truer that can be said. Horses as well as all other animals on earth have been around for since the beginning of time and we're all able to uh, heal most wounds that occur um, but in our effort to try to do the best for our horses we sometimes muck things up and toward the end of this little presentation i will be definitely getting in on it and telling you what you can do to avoid problems but let's just start with the skin in this little dappled horse i want to talk to you about the basics of skin uh, it's basically made up of fat and protein. Uh, it's loaded with hair, as we all know, and that's for thermal regulation, which just means control the body temperature to make them warmer in the cold temperatures and make them a little bit cooler in the hot temperatures. And it's also used for sensing things. Obviously, they can feel things through the hair that's on their skin. It's also loaded with sweat glands for thermal regulation and pheromones for attracting uh, other horses or um, their mates. They also are, the skin is also filled with nerves for sensing temperature, pressures, and textures. And also it is uh, colored uh, for identification or in the case of zebras, the maybe it's for fly control, the way the zebras are striped. I thought that was a kind of interesting story. Um, there's muscles in the skin that uh, raise and lower the hair and they also are there to twitch the skin. I'm sure you've seen that as you lightly touch a horse or fly lanes on the horse, and their whole skin shakes as they try and get the, the, the uh, fly off of it. It's loaded with blood vessels to bring healing materials and for thermal regulation. Obviously, when they're cold, they'll bring in more blood to take that heat. Pardon me. Well, they bring in more blood to bring in warmth and also to take heat away, so it works both ways. Um, the skin has thickness and strength to become an effective barrier to keep what is outside out and what is inside in. And that seems like a very simple sentence, but it is the primary purpose of skin to keep everything contained inside of us and keep all the things that are out there like dirt from coming in. Flexible to move over joints and it is considered the largest organ and is multifunctional and very complex. So complex that I decided to draw this squiggly thing. And I hope most of you aren't laughing or just blinking your eyes and saying, what the heck is this? But this is a little bit of a schematic that I'm going to be using throughout uh, this presentation. I have the blue layer, which is the skin. The black layer, the black line that goes on top. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the first top black line going from left to right is that. And then the second black line going from left to right is the inner layer of skin, and the blue represents the whole thickness of the skin. And that's very important to understand because skin does have a thickness. Then below the skin, you have this red layer, which we call the subcutaneous, or what a lot of people um, condense into sub Q. And then below that, you either have bone or muscle, whatever's inside that we don't want to get out. It's the skin, basically, just like you have a skin on an airplane or um, a boat or anything. The skin is what covers the outside, uh, the skin of an apple, for instance. Now, these uh, red lines at the bottom and the yellow lines at the bottom that squiggle up and become thinner are the blood vessels and the nerves that go up and innervate this whole area. And then, of course, you have these little tiny purple things that are all uh, sweat glands and these long black lines, thin black lines of the hairs that are, are attached and go up and down. So that's basically a schematic. I'm not here to teach you the ins and outs of uh, dermatology. I just want to give you an idea of what a wound is. And by definition, it's an injury or damage to the skin's outer layer. Now, I divide them into a non-wound skin problem, such as bruises, lumps within the skin or under the skin, allergic reactions such as hives, etc. Partial skin thickness wounds, and this is one of those important things to understand, partial skin thickness wounds, which, such as abrasions, temperature injuries such as sunburn or frostbite and abscesses, and full thickness, uh, full skin thickness wounds, which are lacerations, punctures, and don't forget, 
not only from the outside from outside in, but from inward out, such as with a broken or compound fracture as the bone comes through. <clears throat> so here's an example of non-wounds. I'll put in a lump, which is a tumor or cancer or even a calcification that lies in this blue layer, which is the um, something that we can feel with our fingers. Um, some of you endurance riders know this trick, but a lot of people will take their horse and work them hard uh, with the saddle on them. And then as soon as they're done, they take the saddle off, um, had a chance to cool down, and that the release of the pressure on the skin can actually rupture some blood vessels, leading to a small um, lump in this area, especially as it calcifies, becomes rock hard. That's basically where it's occurring in the skin uh, area. You can also get stromas, hematomas, and bruising in the lower area <clears throat> or the sub-Q layer like this. Um, they're usually a fluid-filled space with or without walls. And the outer layer, that's the most important thing to understand, that upper black line is intact. All right? Remember, the upper black layer is the outer side of the skin. This is where the hair is. And that is intact in both of these. And finally, the third lump is non-skin lumps, such as uh, a swollen tendon, a distended joint sheet, uh, ten, a joint capsule, or a tendon sheath. And we can feel these, and it will displace the skin into these bumps here. The bottom line is the outside layer is always intact. So really, that has nothing to do with what we want to talk about. But I did want to let you know that there's something what I call non-wounds. Um, non uh, and I put them in the wounds because it has to do with the skin. So let's get into um, the next section, which is the Skin thickness and I want to go into abscesses just for one or two slides abscesses is a partial skin thickness wound in my definition now not everybody will agree with it but because the, the abscess will try and wall off the object that is trying to eject from the skin and so it will create a wall and I always say abscesses are beautiful defense mechanisms but they can hurt scar and damage as they save lives schematic of three different types of abscesses and you can see this top black line has a break where yellow is coming out, representing pus that's coming out. Uh, over on the right-hand side, you can see the abscess is just in the skin, and that's just like a, a zit in your skin. Um, so the pus is coming out. That's your pimple right there, basically in a, in a gland. Uh, over on the left-hand side, you can see that this abscess comes to the subcutaneous area and invades that. But you see the black line that comes all the way around it. And, and is intact, is basically still um, uh, an intact outer skin. So technically it's a partial skin thickness because the outer edge has that hole in it where the pus is coming out, but it actually walls itself off. And one in the middle goes all the way down to beyond the skin. And you can get abscesses coming in from areas uh, beneath the sub-Q areas, um, such as an abscess that's in the muscle. So anyway, that's all I want to say about abscesses. Let's get over that because a lump is a lump until proven otherwise. And John King, who's a great corneal pathologist who passed away recently, uh, taught me that uh, whenever we feel a lump, we don't know what it is until we take a biopsy of it. And we really don't uh, care until we know what it is exactly before we can help you out. Um, but let's get into partial skin thicknesses. Because uh, this is where we're going to get into the meat of the issue. Sorry, that's a pun for all you wound freaks out there. Um, but here you can see the upper black line is broken. And this big green banana thing in here is representing a, a void in the skin. But I want you to notice where these green arrows are. And the inner layer of skin is still intact. This is what we call a thickness wound. And what's really cool about a partial skin thickness wounds is that is still covering the outside of your body. It's not letting things out. It's not letting guts or bones spill out. And it's not letting bacteria come in. Uh, partial skin thicknesses are often worrisome for people because uh, you'll see some blood coming out. Uh, it may look like it's got a local infection as it invades this area, but uh, the horse is usually um, not affected too much by it unless there's a lot of bruising. But the important part uh, thing to remember is that the barrier remains intact. You can put anything on these things and they will heal as long as the, ca the cause is removed. A cause such as venom, a toxin, you know, from fly bites, even a snake bite, um, thermal damage, 
uh, snake bite, I'm not saying that it punctures the skin. I mean, just like uh, any kind of bite where it just kind of scrapes. Uh, cat scratch, for instance, it scrapes the outside. Uh, thermal damage such as sunburn can bubble up the skin and cause a, a, um, a damage to the outer a layer, uh, but it doesn't get into the inner layer. Allergens such as hives can call it to erupt and create pustules that come out and other internal, external causes. So that has to be removed, but all in all, most medicines will help the reaction, such as anti-itch cream, but the skin will heal on its own by replacing it from, from the damaged area uh, coming from the inside layer out. Uh, think of the last time you got sunburned where your um, outer uh, layer of your skin bubbled and burst and, and exfoliated and, and itched and it was awful, but it finally healed itself and you didn't put yourself on antibiotics, you didn't worry about suturing up a sunburn because it was only a partial skin thickness uh, wound. Now the next two pictures I'm gonna show are of wounds, and if you have a queasy stomach, uh, you can avert your head. Uh, but here's a partial skin thickness uh, wound right here. And you can see the blood that's trickled down, trick down, tri trickle down the leg, um, and there's dirt and debris attached to it. But this did not penetrate the full thickness of the skin. So there's nothing here to suture or worry about. And it, you can actually look around the wound, and it doesn't look too damaged. You don't see a lot of bruising going on. So this just need a little bit of cleanup, a little bit of surface antibiotics just to keep this kind of clean, and it would scab over, and next thing you know, this would be healed, no big deal. The second picture, again, is a scrape of a horse that happened on the chest, and you can see uh, it's his right chest, which is on the left side of the picture. There's actually two little cuts where the horse ran into something and scraped himself. So it's a scrape, abrasion, a, a partial skin thickness. But you can also see that his chest is filled with fluid, and that's the bruising that can occur. When the tissues are damaged, um, uh, blood vessels will leak, uh, lymph will leak in, into the area, and will create this dependent edema that we've got here. Um, and that will sl slowly be absorbed. But the thing to know about this is even though it looks swollen and such, it is um, sterile. <clears throat> so there is no infection. The horse isn't affected by it. He may be sore from bruising, but he's not sore from infection. It's usually not hot or swell swollen. The interesting thing is um, on this uh, picture, and you're going to see a picture later, there's a fly right there at the bottom of that swelling. Flies tend to be attracted to these wounds, and it's the biggest problem with horses that are kept outside. Flies look horrible with their dirty feet and their mouth parts getting all over it, and that's why you have to attend to these things and keep them clean. But again, you don't have to put them on antibiotics or do anything spectacular. You just have to keep the area clean. Now, here's the, here's the really good part. This is the discussion of full skin thickness wounds, which is probably why most of you are here. Um, the external causes can be a puncture, a laceration, or just blunt trauma running into uh, a post can uh, rip the skin. Uh, you can have internal causes such as bone fragments from within, and it's called a compound fracture. The barrier to entry of bacteria organs has been breached, and that's the difference between a partial skin thickness and a full skin thickness wound. Here is a, a diagram. Again, the blue is the skin, the red is the sub Q, and the yellow line is basically showing um, underneath. But you can see all the black lines have been severed and the skin edges have been drawn apart. <clears throat> um, there's going to be blood with these things usually. Um, and the blood is really important to talk about. But before I get there, I want you to understand that where this arrow is coming in, is loaded with bacteria. Bacteria is everywhere. It's in the dirt, in the barn, and we all know how dirty the barn can be. So I like to discuss something called the three-hour rule. Whenever the skin is broken and the barrier is gone, there's no protection from invading bacteria. And once bacteria enter, it takes about three hours for them to multiply to a number that can overwhelm the local defense mechanism. The bacteria will then invade the surrounding tissue, creating inflammation, necrosis of tissue, and even death in some cases. So whenever you have a cut, think of how, many, how much time it lapses and try and get this uh, wound cleaned up. And this applies to cuts on your hands, on any place in your body, anywhere, even your dog or cat. Whenever you have a cut, you really need to start cleaning it up. And on average, this time, uh, hours. You can use any soap you want. Antibacterial soap is good, but in reality, all soap is good. Uh, and water, and just try to, to 
cut down the bacteria because a lot of these wounds are inoculated, which means when you have the puncture, you're actually taking bacteria and injecting it into the cell laceration. Um, when you have a laceration, um, whatever causes the laceration, such as a stick, is loaded with bacteria and dirt, and it digs in that area. Um, <laughs> I have a rule, clean the heck out of every wound, no matter how long it's been. Protect anyone from further contamination with a bandage, any bandage. The first three hours is so critical that you just want to patch things up, even if the, your vet can't get out there for a while to suture things up. The more you clean it up, the better off you're going to be. Um, here's a story of a horse that I did that accidentally fell on the roadside, uh, right on the shoulder of the roadside, fell right on his shoulder. And uh, I was called out there, and, and he didn't bother to clean this wound up. So I spent some time, and, and I would probably spend twice as much time cleaning the wound that I, than I would actually suturing the wound. And I'll never forget, I cleaned and cleaned and cleaned, and I was, you know, I don't want to get too graphic, but I really went into every part of that wound and scoured the, everything. When I was all done, I had my gloves on, I had my sterile uh, sutured material, and I started to suture my first placement of the needle, and I heard it crunch on a rock. And I dug down deep, and there was a pebble that was still stuck between the layers underneath the skin that I had missed. So even with diligence, you're going to miss stuff, but that horse is, would, healed beautifully once I got all that stuff out of there. The godliness, I'm going to repeat that later on uh, because there's nothing more important than cleaning a wound. Now, the next question is to suture or not to suture. And this question comes up to me all the time. Should I uh, suture or shouldn't I? Uh, but before I go on, I just want to ask, are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions going over what skin is, what partial uh, skin thickness wounds are, what non-wound, um, non-penetrating uh, wounds look like? Anything about that? All right. Good. Well, I'm, I'm just going to take a quick break and, and suck down some water here. Okay. <clears throat> to suture or not to suture. Here's the deal. All wounds can heal without sutures. What sutures do is they accelerate the healing process for only one reason. It closes the gap and therefore eliminates the time needed to close the gap. Sutures often prevents scars, but not always. Um, in all wounds, almost all wounds, have surrounding tissue damage. Unless a wound is created by a super sharp scalpel blade by a surgeon, that's the least traumatic wound you can get. But most wounds require blunt force trauma of some sort, and the wave of tissue, that go, a uh, wave of pressure and damage that goes out from that laceration can do soft tissue damage. And that's something that we all have to talk about. Um, do burns have to be cleaned is a question. Um, burns are kind of tricky because that's like a chemical thing. Um, the burn you can clean, but the problem is still going on because the skin is still hot. The first thing I do with any burn is to cool it with either cold water or ice. Ice is the best thing. You have to stop the thermal destruction that's occurring. Then you can put on things that will stop the burn, such as aloe. I know aloe works great on humans. It works on almost all burn patients. And that stops the further destruction. But because that's a partial skin thickness, it's not as important to clean them as it is a full thickness skin uh, problem. Whenever you have the edges of the skin that you can take with your fingers and actually peel apart and see underneath, such as muscle or bone, then you have a full thickness skin wound and those need to be cleaned um, with attention to details. Hope that answers that question. Okay. <clears throat> Wounds heal from side to side, not from end to end. And I'm going to give that quote to a professor at Cornell's vet school. Uh, I remember several people saying it. Here is a wound that black represents uh, the skin, and the red is the wound. And I have measured here the width and the length. And here's another wound where the width is virtually the same, but the length is much longer. But because the wounds heal from side to side, not end to end, both of these wounds will heal just as fast. 
That's one of the secrets about castrations in horses, where you create a wound to, to exteriorize the testicle for removing. Uh, a lot of surgeons try to make a very small hole, which makes no sense because a hole that's one inch long and a hole that's six inches long will heal exactly the same. And that's just one of the truisms that you should always remember. So when you see a wound on your horse that seems like it's a mile long, it's going to heal just as fast as a, a one that's only an inch long. In wound healing, blood flows everything. And that's something that uh, I've found over the years in, in watching these horses heal. And I want to explain to you exactly what that means. So in the next uh, six or eight uh, diagrams, I'm going to show you uh, the difference. Now, this black vertical uh, mass here um, is basically a leg uh, on your horse. And the green line is the laceration. And I call this a vertical laceration. It's a full thickness skin laceration that goes uh, straight up and down. And the yellow arrows actually are representing <clears throat> the blood supply. And what's really cool about these things is the blood can come all down here and heal every bit of this thing. So suturing something like this is easy. In addition, there's no tension on this wound trying to pull these edges apart. So when you, whenever you have a vertical wound on a horse's leg, you should have pretty good healing. The problem with these things as I demonstrate with these squiggly red and yellow lines, is all the tissue damage, damage that can occur from the traumatic injury. So when a horse, horse's leg comes and hits himself on the inside of his cannon bone and scrapes down and opens up the skin all the way because he had a, a nail that was sticking out, there's going to be trauma that the force of the hoof hitting, and you're going to have bruising and such. All this damaged material has to come out. That's one of the critical things about healing. It just doesn't mag magically get absorbed. It basically dies, and anything that's dead inside the body, underneath the skin, is ejected out, usually in an abscess. And that's why I showed you abscesses before, because I wanted you to understand that the body has this incredible ability to take stuff that's underneath its skin and get it outside. So in this case, when somebody comes in and sutures this, and I, and I really, I forgot to, to do the slide that shows you this, but this whole wound can be sutured up beautifully. But what's really important is the very bottom has to be left open and all this damaged tissue will drain out that hole that you leave in the bottom and the top will heal from the top down so beautifully you won't even know this horse ever had a problem. These are really easy to heal as long as you don't button it all up. You have to leave a hole in the bottom to allow all the strangers to come out. <clears throat> so let's look at one that's called a horizontal laceration where it goes across the leg. Now your yellow arrows are showing blood flow and blood flow always comes to the heart down the leg. And the problem is it has to come around and try and get this area below the laceration. And it's very difficult. And where this red squiggly line is, is located here, that's where you have a lot of tissue damage that can't get out. And so you're going to have swelling below this. You're going to have a lot of uh, issues that occur. And so these type of wounds take a little bit more care. If you suture something like this up, be aware that the tension on a leg always goes up and down and may pull that apart. So you have to be very careful with these things and you have to be a good surgeon to bring something like that together. You also have to leave a hole for drainage in this because you will get drainage from the damaged tissue below. But you, what's also important is to apply pressure with a bandage because the bandage will help push this um, debris in the form of uh, pus that's going to form in there. It'll push it up and out that hole because this green line not only is the wound, but it's the exit hole for all damaged skin. So you have to make sure that that hole stays open. There are some veterinarians who will actually place a rubber tubing in here and, 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 and uh, create another hole below that. Damage will have a place to come out, and it's called a stent. And, and it's basically a, a pardon me, it's called a drain, and, and not a stent, pardon me. And that drain will help. Uh, let that stuff out. But whenever you place a drain in there, it also is an, an access point for bacteria to enter. So some vets don't believe in putting drains in, some do, and that in your vet may want to do that. But that's a horizontal laceration and all this damage something is very common. They're called V flaps. And these V flaps are uh, easily understood when you think of something that 
touches on a point on the horse's skin and then shears up or shears down and creates these V flaps. And this is what I call a V flap facing down. Now, the green line represents the laceration. And on the right hand side, I've got a cutaway. So you can see that this laceration isn't straight across the skin, but actually moves at an angle from a lower left to upper right in the middle. And where I have yellow, this is where a lot of tissue damage can occur and the blood vessels are damaged because blood cannot get into these very thin areas. In fact, oftentimes we just cut this area off because we know that it's never going to heal. It's, it turns into dead leather, if you will. So as the blood comes down the leg, it's going to fill in this whole V flap, except for the possibility of the tip, which has been sheared off in such a thin, like taking a slice of cheese with a cheese uh, slicer. It can, uh, it can um, shear it away and, and the blood flow can be damaged. So <clears throat> oftentimes the tips of these uh, will, what we call dehiss or just come apart. Some oh. people are saying the picture is fuzzy. Is there a way to go back? And okay. Um, hopefully that picture isn't fuzzy. That's, that's the vertical. Do you know which picture was fuzzy? <clears throat> I wouldn't blame you if you thought that was fuzzy because I made a bunch of squiggly lines in it. I think it's just the speed of what you're downloading. If you have a slow speed, it may be taking a while to get these pictures to load up. And there's nothing I can do on my end uh, to make it better other than come on back and watch the um, replay of this. But you get the idea of these V-flaps. This next picture is the V-flap, and the white circles that I've gotten there are the sutures. And the sutures are where the veterinary will uh, bring them together. Uh, but a lot of vets will leave this bottom flap open. Again, this will help all the drainage. It provides a natural outlet uh, for that. Now, here's this very similar diagram, but now we have the V-flap facing up. And this is a much more difficult uh, wound to heal because, again, Blood starts from the heart and goes down to the toes. As it comes down to this V-flap, blood vessels have been cut off with the laceration. Now the horse has to bring blood vessels down around it and back up to the flap. And what's very difficult about this is that uh, they just don't do it that way. So that's why I put a circle with a slash through it. It just doesn't happen. On the right-hand side is the cutaway. And again, you can see that the, the skin, again, is is lacerated from upper left to lower right. And again, the blood is coming down, but it just can't get back up into that yellow area to cause uh, some healing. So what a lot of vets will do in, in a facing up is they'll suture one side. And by suturing it together, they're gonna have eliminated the time it takes to fill in the gap. And the blood vessels will soon cross over this and, and, and um, vascularize this flat facing up. <clears throat> but they also have to leave a, a drainage point at the bottom right-hand side and the whole left-hand side in this case. So, again, exudate can come out, and they're going to put a good pressure bandage on to eliminate the space where uh, fluids accumulate. Because the thinner the space, the more likely the fluid will find its way out and out, out the open uh, hole. So now we're going to talk about, and we've already started on this, something called primary intention healing. Um, and that's when uh, the skin is drawn together with suture material. And the only healing needed then after the self-cleaning of the wound is the attachment of the skin edges. In other words, suturing brings the skin edges together and then all they have to do, <laughs> I just got a, a text in the middle of this, sorry about that. Um, the only thing they have to do is um, uh, bring bring that attachment together because the sutures have brought the skin edges together. If you don't suture, then those skin edges are apart, and it's going to take time for those edges to come together. And then once they come together, then you have healing. But we can uh, override that with sutures. It also um, is to remove the tension that draws the skin edges apart. So in other words, by uh, bringing the, the cabling in, you can draw the two edges together so now the edges touch without the sutures actually doing the work on the skin, which is kind of cool. All right. Now, uh, it's so funny that the, the texts that have come in, I don't know if you guys can see them on yours. They pop up the notifications and, and it dings in my ear and, and it, it, sorry, it distracts me, <clears throat> but that's okay. Uh, 
All right, let's just go on to this. This is a picture of a full thickness wound with both edges um, are drawn apart. There's this big white gap in the middle and the blue again, it represents the outer the skin and the um, red represents the subcutaneous. And I've thrown in this green layer, which is what I call the epithelial. And the, the epithelial is actually the inner layer. But I, I drew it as a separate line because I wanted to demonstrate something. And again, this is just a schematic. It's not actual reality. Uh, it's a schematic to represent what reality does. Okay, so when we do primary, uh, um, the first thing we do is we bring in suture material and close any muscle layers that are below. This is, uh, it immediately removes the gap. Remember this huge white gap in here is where all sorts of things can accumulate like damaged tissues and such. And we want to eliminate this space. So the first thing we do is we eliminate the space by drawing these two edges together using a lot of very strong material because muscle will be pulling against it and using a suture pattern that crisscrosses and distributes the tension over several areas. See this epithelial edge is also still not together and the skin edge is not together, but it's closer. How far away it is. And by drawing the bottom, you're actually starting to draw the bottom edges together. Now, the next thing they do is they come in here, cutaneous, where these, this long black arrow points to the green. And another suture has been brought into the sub-Q area to bring everything as, as tightly together as possible. Now, what's really cool about the sub-Q is it's a lot stronger and you can get a good bite on it and you can really put a lot of pressure with your suture material to bring this together. And notice that the skin has become uh, close together. They're actually touching this diagram, which is really cool because that has eliminated all the dead space. The thing you have to do is put in the final suture through the skin and that completely closes the space but there's very little tension on here. The least amount of tension on the skin will provide the best results in healing. The more tension you put on here, the more chance of you having scars from the wound. <clears throat> so you have your first layer, which is the muscle layers underneath. Second is the sub-Q layer, which is a green layer in here. That's the bottom layer of the skin. And then the third layer is to come in here and close the skin. And that's what primary um, intention healing is all about. Let's deal with second intention healing. And that's when the skin is left unsutured and edges remain apart. Now, as with primary healing, uh, cleaning the wound is very important. You know, just go in there with anything you got. Hydrogen peroxide, I wouldn't recommend alcohol because that stings. I wouldn't put anything in a wound that I wouldn't want in a wound myself. A betadine scrub, that can be very uh, painful, uh, but it does a great job in cleaning and flush with copious amounts of water. <clears throat> and then, uh, you can put some um, antibiotics either in the horse's system or on the wound itself. But whatever you do, you're trying to make the wound clean because no healing can occur with dirt in there. Now, stage one is laying down of what's called a bed of grain. And this is a red tissue that basically covers up the gap and closes it. It's a temporary Band-Aid that nature puts on all wounds to help keep the guts from coming out and dirt from getting in. Stage two is the migration of the epithelial tissue across the granulation tissue. Now, if you remember back in this picture here, we had the muscle layer, <clears throat> and then we had this green um, sub-Q layer, or pardon me, uh, epithelial layer that tries to migrate across. But in second tension healing, it has to do it on its own because they're not putting uh, sutures in there to make it come together. And then, of course, the third stage is the migration of the skin over the epithelial tissues. So we're gonna demonstrate this here. <clears throat> Here, this bright red in the middle is what we call granulation tissue. If you are a sports fan, I know almost everybody's seen a sports stadium that has a, a retractable roof. And with a push of the button, the roof comes over and closes over the arena. Well, it closes over a structure. And if you look at the skin as the roof coming across, it can't come across unless there's, there's a structure to come across on. And that's what the granulation tissue does. The granulation tissue fills in and provides a structure for the epithelial cells to march across. And as once they cross over, then the skin can heal on top of that. Or three stage process. So here's a picture or a schematic, I should say, of the same wound I just showed you right here, but looking down on the leg. So here's the leg. 
and here's the wound, and the bright red represents the granulation tissue. And I used a green line here because the white line just didn't do as well as I wanted. So I made it green for you to understand that this is the epithelial cells that are coming across the edge, marching their way across the granulation tissue. And, and slowly, I mean millimeter by millimeter, it will slowly close this gap as it marches from one side to the other. It will heal this thing up very well. A real picture of a wound. It's a granulation tissue. Uh, so again, if you have a squeezy stomach, uh, you might not want to watch. But here's one that's healed fairly well. And these two red lines that I put on the picture show a very faint white to pink line that goes around the granulation tissue. And that's the epithelial cells coming across. And when you see that, things are looking really, really good. Interesting in this uh, wound is that you'll see a lot of dirt and debris that's attached to the scab. What a lot of people don't understand, understand about scabs is they are nature's bandage. They, it's there to protect and allow the epithelial cells to migrate across the granulation tissue underneath the scab where it won't be rubbed off or, or, or blocked in any way. So scabs are really a beautiful thing. And if you have the propensity to want off, uh, don't. Get over it. Because the scab is there for a reason. And there's beautiful healing going on underneath it. And every time off, your actual epithelial cells that are trying to come across. And that's why people who pick scabs on their own bodies will be left with scars because it keeps filling in with um, uh, other ways of healing because the primary way of healing is, is being uh, interrupted. Okay, let me go back to our, my schematic. And here, uh, the granulation tissue has completely come across and this green line has come across and that's the epithelial cells that have laid down the bed. It's the roof that's gone over the retractable dome. And now the blue skin can come in and fill this whole area in. And you can see that now this looks more like a partial skin thickness, which is exactly what it is until it's completely healed, just like any scraper or abrasion. It started off as a full thickness skin. Granulation tissue created a bed of, of, of uh, a bandage, if you will, to protect that wound from, from coming in. And then the epithelial cells came across. Now let me go backwards to this picture one more time where the scab is. This scab is formed from exudate, from uh, damaged material, from bacteria, from pus, but it's all on the surface. It's not on the leg. If you, you can look around this leg, this leg does not look inflamed or swollen or, or affected in any way. Um, nice pink healthy granulation tissue with a very faint white border of granulation tissue uh, epithelial cells that are marching their way across and that will heal this up beautifully in no time at all and then suddenly one day the scab falls off and everything underneath it is healed so granulation tissue i'm going to take a pause if anybody's got any questions about that <clears throat> i'm going a little slow here explaining this because once you understand what granulation tissue is, uh, at the final end of this, I'm going to tell you why humans are create proud flesh. <clears throat> and once you figure that out, you'll never have a case of proud flesh again in your horse owning career. So granulation tissues, uh, normal appearance is dark red <clears throat> with a cobblestone surface. Uh, so that's normal. It's a warning sign, but not in granulation tissue. It's normal. It's filled with blood and blood vessels but it has no nerves, and it quickly becomes covered with a scab, which is nature's bandage of protecting the fragile. Epithelial should remain on the wound at all costs until it falls off naturally. Exuberant granulation, and granulation tissue is also known as proud flesh. So granulation tissue is normal, but when it becomes exuberant, when the tissue rises above the epithelial tissue, it effectively prevents its migration across it, formation of skin. So as long as there's granulation tissue, the wound is no longer a full thickness wound. All pus seen on the wound is only surface bacteria and not coming from inside the wound. Antibiotics are not necessary, but as soon as it becomes proud and sticks out above, that's when he has some problems. Treatment for exuberant granulation tissue is to prevent it from happening in the first place. I will tell you how that's done. Not completely heal until the proud flesh is removed. 
And oftentimes people use medications um, to reduce the amount of proud flesh, but they're often ineffective against large amounts. But worse, a lot of the medications you put on granulation tissue in an effort to reduce it actually creates more. People see this and they start scrubbing with betadine or some other soap. It's the worst thing in the world you can do. Putting any medication on granulation tissue is not only a waste of your time, promotes proud flesh and makes things worse. The only way you can actually effectively do this is, is something called surgical debulking. And uh, I'm going to show you what that's all about um, in the next couple. Of What's the question? Is the same mechanism of action true with other mammal wounds? Uh, That's wheels. Yeah, um, horses are pretty unique in creating granulation tissue, exuberant granulation tissue. Uh, the question is, is the same mechanism of action true with other mammal wounds? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, it doesn't occur in humans, uh, in most humans. Um, they were what I was told in vet school. Um, Black uh, individuals can have proud flesh. Caucasians and uh, um, others don't have that. So that's what I've been told. I don't know that for a fact. Maybe somebody who's got some nursing experience can answer that. It's not true in dogs. It's not true in cats. It's not a big deal. But I'll also tell you, it usually occurs below the knee of the hawk in the horse. Usually above the knee of the hawk. On the body of the horse, you don't have to worry about exuberant granulation tissue. And I apologize. I forgot to put that in here. But uh, it's really important. It's below the knee of the hawk. Uh, what are the effective medications for uh, – a question is, what are the effective medications for uh, taking care of exuberant granulation tissue? There's only one that I know of. Um, it's Granulex. It's basically meat tenderizer in a can, and what it does is it digests away the granulation tissue and allows the epithelial cells to come across and doesn't usually damage the epithelial cells. Just about everything else that you can put on there will cause that. Your questions on that, when I get to how to prevent this, which is going to be a couple of, uh, couple of things down here. Uh, but I just want to show you some proud flesh, and that's going to be in the next picture. So again, if you have a queasy stomach, the next two are going to have some bloody pictures. This is a wound on a, a pastern, and uh, again, a fly is sitting right in the middle of it. It's, uh, it's good cobblestone, uh, red appearance, tells me everything's going fine there. Uh, you can see the thin pink band that goes around there. That's normal healing tissue. It's beautiful epithelial cells trying to come across. And there's a little bit of a scab on this, which tells me that this you know, everything's fine. But what you don't see is, in the, is what you're going to see in the next uh, picture. Okay. That's the same one. And now from the side view, you can see that it's exuberant. It's actually becoming a physical barrier to the healing. If healing comes from the edges of the wound, and in this case, it's a circular wound, so it's coming from all edges trying to close in the center, it physically can't do it because the granulation tissues come up and prevented it, physically blocked it position of the scalpel here as it starts to make its cut right at the edge where it matches the skin. And that scalpel blade will go straight down and cut it level with the skin. I'll have a picture of that in a couple more slides. <clears throat> but we're surgically debulking this. And that is the most effective way. It's rapid. It's like, you know, as soon as you're done cutting, it's gone. You don't need to rely on any medications. And then what I'm going to teach you is how to take care of a wound with granulation tissue from this point on, and this will prevent granulation tissue from occurring in the first place. All right, <clears throat> here are the causes of proud flesh. It removes the epithelial cells. Now, I told you in the beginning, scrub like crazy with anything you got and have at it. The first day, you got to get it clean. But from that point on, stop physically scrubbing. It is counterproductive and causes proud flesh. Don't use uh, soaps, alcohol, peroxide, chemicals, or anything else that will destroy the epithelial cells. There's nothing that I know of that is kind to epithelial cells other than nature's um, own uh, fluids. So anything you put on there other than uh, cold water hosing is going to cause problems. So don't. 
Um, all water-resistant ointments, creams, and oils will destroy the epithelial cells and act as a blockade. The epithelial cells cannot move through ointments and creams unless they're water soft. So anything that has oil or um, Vaseline's or petroleum-based, uh, they're going to destroy things and create proud flesh. So keep them out of there. Applying gauze, cloth, or any bandage material such as uh, baby diapers <clears throat> will rip the epithelial cells off you peel them off. It'll take the scab with it. It takes epithelial cells with it. And even though you think you're doing something good in helping your horse, you really are not. You're destroying those cells every time you do it. And of course, movement and tension in front of the joints uh, will not help healing. And that's why proud flesh is so common on the front side of the hock. Not only is it shaped in a V that catches things like wires and creates these horrible lacerations, but because it moves so much, it keeps pulling that wound away and never allows the epithelial cells to come across there. So that represents a huge challenge, it's something we all have to deal with. And if you scrub and put gauze on and put soaps on, on top of it all, guarantee you're going to have proud flesh and an ugly scar. So how do you prevent it? After your first thorough scrubbing, only use gentle flowing water. No jet stream, no thumb over the end of the hose with high pressure. If you see a chunk of uh, shavings that's attached to the scab, you want to gently try and remove it, fine. But this horse is going to cover that with granulation tissue in like literally days. And it's going to try and seal that thing up right away. And then it has the next project of bringing the skin over that granulation tissue. More than a gentle water flow, you're going to create it. Use only water-soluble antibiotics applied to the bandage, not to the wound. So instead of globbing it on your wound, if you're going to bandage the area, put it on the bandage. And I like furous in powder or furous in spray or some sort of water-soluble powder. And that's the only antibiotic I use. And it's only just to keep the surface bacteria down. It really is not necessary for the wound. And once, you know, other than the initial uh, episode of antibiotics that your vet will probably always recommend, uh, to prevent uh, infection from the inside, especially if it's been more than a couple of hours since the wound occurred, like it happened sometime last night, and here it is the morning. Uh, antibiotics are very important to cover that from the inside out. But to put any wa uh, non-water soluble antibiotic on there, like furosin ointment, is asking for trouble. It, only use non-stick pads directly on the wound. Never ever gauze. Only non-stick pads. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And applying pressure to the wound to physically keep the granulation tissue below the epithelial layer actually works pretty well. I'm going to show you how to put a bandage on that does that without, without sticking. So it's like pressing it in so the edges can come across. Okay, this is uh, coming up, I think, the last, no, it's not the last ugly picture, but it's another ugly picture. So again, turn away if your stomach doesn't like blood. This is the same round granulation tissue that you saw earlier with a debolt. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a side view, but I think you can see pretty clearly that it's now level with the skin. <clears throat> now, what's really important to note is it is bloody. You can see all the blood on the floor. It's a very bloody process. The granulation tissue is basically blood, and blood is so important for healing, and it's trying desperately to bring in the cells and the materials and nutrients it needs to heal this. So it's important to have the blood there, and it's not going to be dead mental of the horse suffer from blood loss from this. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I was saying that uh, this there's a lot of blood seen here. You can see it in the background on the ground, and you can see it. I've, I've cleaned it off, but this now has been cut level with the skin, and now this pink la layer of epithelial cells can start to march across this granulation tissue with a little bit more help from us in bandaging. I'll show you how to do this, and it's really cool. And by the way, <clears throat> there are no nerves in here. There's no reason to sedate the horse. This horse is not sedated. It has no local uh, anesthetic put on there. Uh, this is all done where the horse is standing comfortably and keeping my blade on the granulation tissue, and the horse is fine. So um, that's just something that I find fascinating. Okay, here's a brand of Auschwitz non-adherent pad. This is what I'm talking about by no stick pad. Anything that has Tefla on it will um, not allow the, the epithelial cells to stick. Question. Um, 
Oh, scratches. Scratches or grease heel is a bacterial infection um, that um, and is, is, is more of a partial skin thickness. It's not a full skin thickness. These are only uh, types of wounds that you would normally suture, but if you don't suture, this is what happens to granulation tissue. You usually don't get granulation tissue from uh, a case of scratches. I have seen a very severe case of scratches that actually split the skin and granulation tissue did come in there. Uh, and that's a little bit more of a, a, a project. Um, and I have a, a way to take care of scratches, which um, if we have time at the end, I'll go over. But I'm down to like five minutes left and I've got a little bit more to cover here. So what I'm about to teach you right now is so important for preventing proud flesh. I want to stay on track there. This is gauze, and this is what you do not want to put on the horse. This will rip off the epithelial cells. So what you want to do is you put a telfa pad here, and then you can see underneath, between the pad and my fingers, is some, is some gauze pads. And what the gauze pads do is allows you to put a little bit of pressure on the wound to help push that granulation tissue back in. So that's what I would do. And then I would take furosone powder or some sort of antibiotic powder and spray it on this gauze pad and then apply that to the, the, to the horse. And you can see me placing on this wound that plus this uh, Coflex, which is a brand of um, elastic, non-stick uh, bandage material. In other words, there's no glue on this. And I, and I like to use this because it's going to be attached to the skin, obviously, on the other side or on the hair coat. And I just want to have a nice bandage that looks like this one I'm done. And this does a great job. It puts pressure. You can see blood coming through here, and that's okay. But I put pressure right on this area on the wound, and now this is really good. Now there's one other step, which I didn't do here, but through the magic of my uh, coloring uh, deal, I was able to color this on. and this. Um, color bandage is what I call elasticons, three-inch elasticon. And you've noticed that elasticon always has a red stripe that goes down the middle of it, and that's because that splits it in half. That allows you to put half of it on the skin and half of it on the bandage. It's a good way to, to gauge this. And you do this on the top and the bottom. Or what this does and makes it so cool is now you can take this horse and turn it out in mud, leather, anywhere you want, and this will seal and prevent blood from coming up in there. Um, if there's any technical difficulties, we might be getting some sound interruption. Okay. Um, hopefully not. So uh, this elasticon, top and bottom, can seal it up. And you can turn the horse out and leave this bandage on for uh, two or three or four days, uh, which is – and it's really good for this wound because this wound will heal beautifully with the pressure that you put on it, the cleanliness that you've got, and a little bit of antibiotics that are on there. And when you're done, you take some scissors and you cut right down the front of this and gently peel that bandage away so it comes off without ripping it off. And what'll happen is you're going to have a wound that heals very quickly with no more proud flesh. And that's how you take care of proud flesh. So, what's the question? Okay, I'm going to get into scratches in a second. Um, I put you off, but um, I just want to cover a little bit more material, like three more slides, and then I'll get into scratches. Um, I want to talk about when things go wrong. Wounds can kill your horse if an infection is allowed to enter and take hold of the damaged area. Um, if there's heat, swelling, pain, or you can always add antibiotics. Please check with your veterinarian, but you'll know that there's a problem. Punctures can be invisible. And the underlying damage uh, can't be seen, but the inoculation bacteria can be significant. And here's a picture of a horse. Um, again, this is, might be ugly for some people, uh, but this is the picture of a horse's hock. Oh, I take that back. This is his knee. Um, you almost can't see it. And you have swelling above the puncture. You can see where the arrows for puncture. And here's the infection that's below with the, the wound with swelling and heat and there's a useless bandage down here this is the most uh, the owner said i thought that's where the problem was he never ever saw this wound up above but in the few days that it passed this wound had become infected it split open and had drainage coming down like this is the same wound as you saw here and he had put a bandage on the bottom 
And this bandage is ineffective. You need to put compression by using um, wraps, such as cotton wraps, uh, down here to apply pressure without damage. Uh, what, what this actually did was, did was it pre prevented blood flow and all of this swelling occurred because it acted like a tourniquet. So uh, these types of wounds you have to do something with. Okay, scratches is, um, you have to find the cause and remove it. And I always ask people uh, on your farm, and most horses have two, three, four horses on a farm, why does only one horse have scratches when the others don't? And it's usually because they have an immune system that's not working very well. For mild cases scratches, what I often do is I go after the cause first, which in my case is a suppressed immune system. So the first thing I do, and it's usually a dirty environment or there's some sort of um, density in population, I deworm the horse once a week for three weeks. And what that does is it stimulates the immune system so it's not fighting the parasites that's a parasite load in them, and then they're able to take care of the scratches on their own. Uh, the next thing is to try and clean them up the best you can. Get rid of the excess hair, especially if it's got a lot of feathers. It's a draft horse or some other horse that has feathers down there. Uh, you want to just take clippers and get them off and get them um, uh, exposed the best you can. Uh, topical antibiotics really help. Um, antibiotics, uh, according to your vet, whichever they like to use, can sometimes help. But this is typical of all uh, partial skin thickness uh, wounds and even non-skin uh, thickness wounds that are caused by something such as an allergen, you have to get rid of the cause or they'll just keep coming back. So scratches has always been a problem. Uh, we had about 20 horses on our farm, maybe 15, and we always had two that had scratches and they also had um, rain rot on their back. And we couldn't figure it out why these two, and it was a mother and daughter of all things. And it wasn't until we um, dewormed once a week for three weeks with ivermectin that we were able to knock down a parasite load. This was back in like the 80s. Um, and by knocking down the parasite load, these horses cleaned their back up, cleaned their scratches or grease heal up, um, and all that problem went away. And then we uh, monitored our, our parasite control on our farm a little bit more effectively back then. Um, and that's what I recommend for most people. I'll find the cause and remove it. Uh, and then work on it like any other wound and clean it up. The most severe case I ever saw of scratches uh, came from the base of the fetlock down the back of the pasture, around the bulbs of the heel, and destroyed the frog of the hoof. It was disgusting. And they had worked with it for two years, and then they had found me and asked me to take a look at it. And the first thing I did was uh, they just dewormed with the ivermectin. So I said, uh, do it two more times. Uh, I also called in a, a farrier. And we actually debrided. Keep going. Um, I, uh, we debrided and, and actually removed all the diseased hoof and sole. I mean, just cut it out. It was just, it's just, it's a bloody mess. And I warned the ladies it's going to be a bloody mess. And the, I warned the farrier that he was going to get bloody doing this. And he says, as long as you're here, doc, I'll go ahead and, and I'll do whatever you say. So I took it all off, got it all cleaned up. And then I covered uh, the wound with uh, furosin ointment um, mixed with uh, tetracycline and DMSO. And we bandaged that hoof in the pastern uh, for um, a week or two, maybe 10 days, um, and kept it clean and pristine. And by two weeks, um, this horse, for the first time in over two years, uh, started to have a normal uh, pastern and fetlock and, and bulbs of the heel. And within uh, two more weeks, uh, you couldn't even tell that there was anything wrong with it. So again, debriding, debulking is important, putting on the right antibiotic and killing the cause, which in this case was uh, parasites, because the other two horses on the farm had no scratches, no grease heel, no problem. It was just one horse with a weakened immune system that wasn't able to take care of the normal bacteria that's in the environment. So it, it got attacked by the bacteria, and, that, and the bacteria did the penetration of the skin and macerated it and caused it to um, become ugly and fester and, and pus and all that stuff. Um, so that's what happened with scratches. So hopefully that helps you with scratches. Any other questions? We've gone an hour on this discussion, and um, I just want to remind people that um, there are a few take-home points that I want you to remember. Um, any other questions that I need to address? 
uh, <laughs> pictures of that story would be very effective. That's back in the 90s. Uh, I wish I could um, pretty, I wish I could tell you, um, show you pictures of that. Um, I did send the article into a magazine uh, that had just printed an article on a very similar case, and uh, they didn't even want to hear about it. Um, I guess it's, it didn't match their agenda of deworming once a week for three weeks. So um, I know that sounds uh, like, where did that come from? You got scratches, why would you deworm the horse? Again, it's the immune system. Ask yourself, why does one horse in a herd of two, three, four, five, six horses have these scratches and the others don't? There's got to be a reason. And so we have to help the immune system come along. Uh, which reminds me of uh, next month's uh, webinar, which is about uh, chronic protein deficiency, uh, which you should mark your calendars for, because I think there's a, a root cause of a lot of things that are going on as well in your horse. But let's go over uh, two slides and go over the take-home points. A lump is a lump until proven otherwise. Uh, act quickly and call your vet for help. Remember the three-hour rule for infection. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Clean, 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 clean. Whenever you find a wound, don't worry about what you're doing to the wound. You can't do any harm the first day. You have to clean it out. Um, and wounds heal side to side, not end to end. So if you have a mile-long wound, don't freak out. It's going to heal just as fast as one that's only an inch long. Blood flows everything to wound healing, and blood comes from the heart to the wound. And anything beyond the wound is compromised because the vessels have been cut and it has to find a new way to get blood in there to heal. So if you have a V-flap facing up or a horizontal uh, wound, it's going to take a little bit longer and it's going to be hard to get the damaged tissue out. Vertical ones do you a lot better and V-flaps facing down are a piece of cake. Suture if you can. If it's within your budget, uh, within your means, go ahead and suture and get it done. But if you can't suture, don't freak out. Follow the rules of how to uh, take care of things and don't mess things up by scrubbing, by applying ointments, by applying gauze that cause these wounds to produce proud flesh. Surgically debulk, if you already have proud flesh, your vet should be able to help you with that. And then follow the rules of water soluble antibiotic, a no stick telfa pad, uh, gauze behind that to put pressure on it. Uh, some elastic bandage to help put some pressure on it without creating a tourniquet for your horse. And then top and bottom layers of the elasticon to keep the, the dirt and the rocks and the dirt and the mud and the blood and the beer from getting in the wound. And um, it will heal up uh, so fast, you'll just be amazed. All horses, all people, all dogs, all animals have this incredible ability to heal. Let's try not to screw that up. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this. Oops, we got a question. Would you recommend, uh, how does doing a fecal check tell if horses have worms? Or, listen, there's a whole webinar on Parasite that, that you should go, uh, a horse talk. Uh, you should check that out. Um, my bottom line in a nutshell, uh, if you want to do a fecal count and it comes back zero, that's great. It means that your horse isn't shedding any eggs. It doesn't mean that your horse doesn't have any parasites in them in an assisted stage, but it doesn't mean that it's shedding any eggs. If your horse is shedding eggs, let's say it comes back and your vet says, oh, it's got uh, 10 eggs per gram of feces. Most of us don't know what a gram is. A gram is 454 uh, grams to a pound. So in every pound of poop, you have 10 eggs per gram or 10 times 454, or bottom line is 4,540 eggs per pound of poop, which to me is an infection. What I, uh, Terry asked, would I recommend uh, probiotics in conjunction with the deworming? Uh, no, I, uh, probiotics is a, is a new um, thing that a lot of people believe in. Uh, but if you want to give probiotics, uh, a cup of plain yogurt uh, gives all the probiotics your horse needs. Uh, what you have to do is add uh, more forage and take away all the uh, inflammatory products that causes inflammation in the hind gut, such as sugar. Uh, including red salt licks, uh, sweet treats, carrots, and things like that. And if you take away that inflammation, you allow you, the guts to actually uh, become um, healthy. Um, if you think of every uh, animal out there, uh, yeah, human plain yogurt. Just go ahead and get some Dan and yogurt. Somebody's If it's got fruit in it, uh, I really don't care. Uh, but plain works just fine. Um, and I don't know how to get in a horse. That's that's the fun of that. I was, um, yeah, I, the sugar free. You can use Greek yogurt. You can use any yogurt. The point is, every yogurt has the probiotics in it. 
Um, but the horse, we are all vessels for trillions of bacteria in our gut. And the whole idea behind probiotics is to seed that gut with friendly bacteria. But why do we need to do that? I mean, we've been survived for tens of thousands of years without having probiotics around. So what's causing our gut to become out of balance? And if you can correct that by removing the inflammatory things such as uh, grain and sugar and things uh, that cause that uh, inflammation and allow the bacteria that's supposed to be there uh, to settle in, uh, they will populate the gut with what they need to do. Um, that's just how we all work. You, me, and, the, and your horse, and your dog, and your parrot. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, become a member of the Horse Advocate. Uh, if you do, you can uh, go to thehorseadvocate.com forward slash grain, and you can see my No Grain Challenge, what I believe, what I think about grain. You can also read about protein and get prepared for next uh, the next webinar. Uh, you can see all the horse talks that I've had up there that talk about laminitis and uh, uh, parasite control and uh, uh, dangerous things on the farm and uh, top 10 eye problems uh, and some other really interesting topics. You can spend a, a lot of time there and have some fun. Remember, when you sign up, you're going to get the free 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship, um, or you can go to the equinepractice.com forward slash books where you can find it um, from the publisher or you can even get it on iTunes um, and have it downloaded right to your iPhone and read it and have it with you at all times. This is how I connect with horses within 30 seconds and, and then place a file in and take care of all their teeth that are hurting them. Um, and I think it's, it's the framework that everyone needs to, to do. It's based on my 40 some odd years of experience with horses. Okay, let's see. Uh, I have a mare that got proud flesh on the middle of her nose. <laughs> middle of the nose uh, could be, um, it could be a laceration, it could be a sunburn, it could be a hypersensitivity to something that she's eating in the paddock that's causing it to split open and it bubbles up with some granulation tissue. Um, that's one of those things that is a little bit more difficult to take care of until you can get rid of the cause. Um, sometimes putting a little uh, Vaseline on there before she goes out where there's uh, um, dew on the grass can prevent that from being burned. It's like a, a chemical burn to a pink nose. Uh, I'm going to ask you, is it pink or white where the, where the granulation tissue is, or is a horse a bay or a chestnut? I wonder if you can answer that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Thanks for all the compliments, guys. I appreciate that. Um, I just want to remind you, um, November 6th, uh, first Sunday about chronic protein, is, it's my latest um, thing. It's my latest, um, the push to let people know just how chronically deficient some of these horses are with the uh, older horses become sway back or uh, loss of a top line in your athletic horse. And we're all trying to uh, exercise a horse to build up the back to make it look better, and then we keep adding sugar to their diet instead of adding the protein that they need to create the muscles. Um, as far as that nose thing goes, if it's a white horse, it's probably an allergic reaction, um, it, and it, it could be a liver toxin that's being released, causing the horse to be photosensitive. And as we move out of summer, that should go away. Um, but I'm not worried about a little pro proud flesh on the nose. That should heal itself. I've never seen it become exuberant or a major problem in the nose or anywhere above the knee or the hock. It's usually below the knee or the hock that you get the exuberant granulation tissue that you have to take care of. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, we've been on this uh, deal for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and I thank you for all your time, for all of you who stuck around and listened to the whole thing, and um, please tell everybody else about this uh, little endeavor of the human world. Uh, thanks again, and good night, and, and before, don't forget, tonight,